right, welcome in Periscope. Welcome in YouTube. Welcome in everybody listening on Apple Podcasts. We're back again. We're doing this periodically over the course of the off season. And again, we're going to try to go back and do it more regularly again once the season starts. But as much as I'm down here in New York, I'm going to try and do as many of these so I can give you guys a different way to interact with me through Periscope, through YouTube, through Apple Podcasts. So we're going to do what we've done the last few times, well, really over the last year with these, and that's we're going to hit five news topics right off the top. We're going to go go through each one of those in depth. Uh, that'll probably take about 10, 15 minutes. Then I'm going to answer all your questions on Periscope. Get out of here probably somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes. And we're going to start with the number one topic, not just in the NFL today, but I'd say the number one topic in all of sports, the Supreme Court. Uh, ruled today that it is unconstitutional um, to have a federal ban on sports gambling. What does that mean? Well, that doesn't mean that they're going to be, you know, there's, that doesn't mean that there's going to be, um, you know, a sports book opening down the street tomorrow. What it does mean is now everything's in the state's hands. And so I'm going to give you guys a number of things from an NFL perspective, and we're going to focus here on the NFL because that's what I cover from an NFL perspective that are important to remember here. And the first thing is that what I just mentioned there, which is that this is probably, this is going to have a massive impact, but it might take some time because of that detail that this isn't opening the floodgates for sports gambling nationwide and mass. It's opening the floodgates. And I guess each state individually is going to decide when they want to turn on the faucet. Um, And so I think as far as the NFL formally getting involved, and I expect that they eventually will, but as far as the NFL formally getting involved and finding a way to make money off of sports gambling and starting to market it to you, I think that that's probably going to have to wait until all of the states that have NFL teams have legalized it, and that could take some time. So why would they do that? Well, the main thing is they want to have equity among their owners, and and so it doesn't seem real fair that there would be you know an opportunity for – the team in California to have a, uh, you know, a, a, a business mechanism that they can cash in off of that a team in say Wisconsin can't. And so, my expectation is that you know eventually there will be sports gambling all over the country, and and it'll be legal all over the country, and teams will be able to monetize this all over the country. I think at first we're probably gonna we may see a handful of states go jump in right away. And that's going to make it for you, the fan, so you can gamble on the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, Major League Baseball, boxing, horse racing, whatever you want to gamble on. I just think that the NFL's involvement of this is going to be slow played a little bit until we wind up having it legal in each of the individual states. Uh, The second point I'd make on this, and I think it's an important one, um, the NBA came out I think this was, I want to say this was probably a couple months ago now, Adam Silver said that he was looking at basically creating a VIG where they that the NBA would try to enact legislation where they would be able to take 1% off the top of every basketball-related bet. I don't think the NFL is going to jump in on that right away. And the reason why, the NFL is really sensitive right now about its relationships with casinos with sports books the reason why is because the Raiders are going to Las Vegas and that's a sensitive thing for them and so I don't think you're going to be the NFL is going to be very very careful about doing things that may take profit away or undercut the power of the casinos the power of the sports books because five years 10 years 15 years from now they could be involved with them they also see the idea of doing this is a low margin business for them. They don't think that there's a ton of money to be made if they're just, you know, peeling 1% off the top and that would really wind up costing, you know, the the, the people who are in business and gambling. And so again, I, I just don't think the cost of ruining the relationship there with the casinos or the sports books would necessarily be worth it when you look at the profit they'd be bringing in. Where I do think that they can make money, where they, they, and more importantly, where they think they can make money is on the idea of doing in-game props. Here's what would happen. You would download a, an app onto your phone, and you'd be able to bet on stuff as the game's going on. So you'd get odds on, say, you know, the, the, the Browns or the Bengals or the, the, the Colts or the Bears or the Rams or the Chargers. You know, they get the ball. Phillip Rivers is lining up under center. Okay, now I can place a bet against three to one odds that they're going to kick a field goal, against five to one odds that they're going to score a touchdown. 
that sort of inter- interactive in-game betting, I think, is a huge part of where the NFL sees this going in five or ten years, where they believe that they can really make money on it and where they believe it can help with the growth of the game, both getting in, getting people in stadiums, because that's been a problem for them, because the at-home product is, imp- is improving at a much faster rate than the in-stadium product. So there's that part of it, impacting people to come into the stadium. I think it's also going to help with the at-home product where people might be more likely to sit and watch games for a longer period of time because kids now, and it's not like me when I was a kid, where we were you know, happy as a pig in shit to sit there for 12 hours and watch football all day. It's not like that anymore. You need to give them some sort of interactive element, and this would really give them an interactive element. Kids now, adults, maybe five or ten years from now. And so I think that that's going to be the the thing you're going to watch for. In-game prop betting, I think, is where the NFL's business is going to be when it comes to this. There's also the business of sponsorship. That's a huge part of this, too. Right now, the NFL cannot have signage in their stadiums that has the word casino on it. They're not allowed to enter into business relationships with casinos that have sports books. This could open up the floodgates as far as that goes, and that sponsorship money could be significant. Um, And then finally – you know, I think that there's the, the the larger piece of this, which is, you know, we mentioned growing the TV ratings, but growing internationally, too, I think is a big part of this, where they believe that they're going to be able to use this to make the game more attractive overseas. What's popular now? Well, esports are popular now. Why are esports popular? Well, because it's a little more interactive than what you see, um, you know, it, traditionally sitting down watching an NFL game or an NBA game or a baseball or a basketball or a baseball or a hockey game. You would be able, like, 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 this would be another way of of marketing it to say people in China, you know, where they don't really understand the game, but they're, but, but you need something to kind of like hook them in to pull them in, and the idea of you know using the in-game props and those sorts of things to pull people in where they can gamble on it, uh, you know, look, I think could be a lure, or at least the NFL sees it as a lure to get fans overseas in. I mean. There's a reason why people like horse racing so much. So those would be my main takeaways. I can answer all your questions on sports gambling. Again, the big thing is, you know, this isn't going to be, you know, it's just a – I don't think you're going to see some sort of enormous turn from the NFL and how they do business. I think their attitude towards it's already changed, so that doesn't need to happen. And I think I think some of the widespread the, – the, the, the big picture business prop proposition that this is for the NFL, that's going to be attacked, I think, when we get past – um, you know, say 30 states legalizing it or 35 states deciding that it's okay. Uh, this is obviously a long time coming. I mean, I'm, me and my producer, Will, we're talking over here. I mean, all you got to do is pull out your phone and make a bet right now. It seems ridiculous that this hasn't happened before. And, I, you know, it, it's, the same, it's the same concept as, the, you know, there's a reason why there are casinos in, in Windsor, Ontario, or in, in Detroit, you know, before there were ca- casinos almost anywhere else because, that, you know, people in Detroit were watching all these people just go across the border and spend their money in Canada because it was legal in Windsor, Ontario. So all those people are crossing the border. Well, what do you do? You legalize it so you've got a chance to compete and keep some of that money at home. And this is the same idea as that. Okay, news item number two today. The safety market is finally opening up. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about that. The reason we're attacking this here, of course, there's the Eric Reed thing, uh, the, the collusion case against the NFL, and the two names that he's sort of been linked to over the course of the last a uh, couple of months in NFL circles, Trey Boston and Kenny Vaccaro, two fairly high-end safeties. Boston, of course, played for the Chargers last year, had a great year. Kenny Vaccaro, a very, very good player for the Saints um, and a former first-round pick. Those guys are still out there on the open market. It's May. So part of the Eric Reed story, a piece of it, and we can argue over how big a piece of it, but a piece of the Eric Reed story is absolutely the fact that the safety market has been so slow to develop. Why? Well, I want to explain that to you guys now, and we'll see how these, what happens with these two guys, what they wind up making out there in the market. The team to look at when you want to look at a team that like really kind of like epitomizes why the safety market is with it is where it is. It's the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills got the best ball production out of their safeties at any team in the NFL. Most interceptions at any team in the NFL, right? They got two guys in last year on contracts that were very, very affordable. Micah Hyde is one. Needs $30.5 million over five years. It's a little over $6 million a year. Of course, former Packer. Jordan Poyer is the other. Came in at $13 million over four. That's a little over th- a little over $3 million a year. So for less than $10 million a year, the Bills had a premier 
safety combination. Now, I'm not saying either of those guys are, are Earl Thomas or Eric Berry or anybody like that, but they had very good production and very good play out of their safeties at a cheap rate. Now, look at where Sean McDermott came from. He came from Carolina. Who were their safeties? Well, Trey Boston was one of them at one point um, who was a, I, I mean, just kind of a, a guy who came out of nowhere as a rookie and really produced, and then they were willing to let him walk. Kurt Coleman was another, uh, a former undrafted free agent who became a very productive player for them. And so we've seen where teams can get away with less at those positions, and that's part of it. So I think the Buffalo Bills are one part of it. The second part of it is what we've seen with the best defenses in the NFL of late. And I think this is sort of the effect the Denver Broncos ha have had on the entire league. Okay. The Broncos won by putting putting their resources into blue chip players and on the edges. So you're talking about corners and you're talking about pass rushers. All right. So in the secondary for all those years with Keeb Tlaib, Chris Harris, they spent a first round pick on Bradley Roby. On the edges of the front seven, it's Vaughn Miller, it's Demarcus Ware for a bunch of years, and they spent a first-round pick on Shane Ray. That hasn't really worked out, so what do they do this year? They spent a first-round pick on Bradley Chubb. That You're seeing the allocation of resources in the NFL in general get directed to a few different positions at the expense of other positions. And so we've seen teams invest in receivers. We've seen teams invest in offensive linemen. Guess what? Running backs aren't really getting paid. We've seen teams invest in defensive pressure players up front. We've seen defenses. We've seen teams invest in corners. Well, what happens? Well, inside linebackers aren't maybe getting paid at the same rate. We see somebody like Alec Ogletree who was rewarded at that rate. He's all of a sudden disposable for the Rams like six months after signing his deal, and safeties have paid the price. And so I think the Boston Vaccaro thing today is very interesting. Of course, it happens after free agent signings come out of the compact pick equation, so teams can be a little bit more liberal about going out and getting guys. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens with those two. I'm also going to be interested to find out whether or not the Colts contacted Eric Reed and if he was interested. Uh, number three, Mark Ingram's suspension came down. This is the end of last week. Um, Peter wrote in his column this morning. Obviously, Peter does a great job with that. Check that out at the MMQB.com. I do disagree with something he said here. He said, and I've heard this a lot the last week. We talked about it on the podcast with Gresh last week. I addressed it in my column, too, that because Mark Ingram suspended, we're going to see more of Alvin Kamara. Sean Payton doesn't need any advice from me. Don't do it, Sean. Don't do it, Sean. Don't do it. I think somebody put it to me best. Um, a few days ago where they said Alvin Kamara isn't a machine gun. He's a sniper rifle. You don't keep firing him at the defense. You can pick him off. And the proof is in his usage. Last year, Mike, Mark Ingram, 571 snaps, and 230 of his 288 touches were carries. So the more physical, the, 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 the physical load, he's carrying the physical load there. Well, what does that free Alvin Kamara up to do? Well, he only played 464 snaps, and only 120 of his touches were on the ground. He had 201 touches. Having Mark Ingram and, and committing to Mark Ingram the way that they did last year allowed them to use Alvin Kamara in so many different ways. Sean Payton should not veer from that. Pete Carmichael should not veer from that. If this is where I actually think like trading for a running back and, and, and we talked about again, me and Will, my producer, talked about this a little bit um, just before we got in here to tape this. Like maybe you go to the Raiders who have Marshawn Lynch and, 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 and Richard and Washington and you ask them, is one of those guys available? If you can find somebody and maybe it's maybe it's Trey Edmonds who's on the roster already. But if you can find somebody who it, who comes cheap. And can take like the part of the Ingram load off the table for Kamara. It's worth it because he's going to be better later in the year. And so, if I'm the Saints, I look at this. I say to myself, "Well, you know, Mark Ingram's aging a little bit, so maybe this is going to be a positive for him, where he's only going to play 12 games. So maybe we get a fresher Mark Ingram at the end of the year." But what we don't want to do is we don't want to go into this and say to ourselves, now let's just throw Kamara at the defense. Now let's just throw Kamara out there. Every don't do that. Don't do that. He's never been a high-volume player. He was effective what he was doing last year. Use him in the same way. Okay, number four, the Matt Patricia case. You guys have all seen it by now. The Detroit News um, was able to unearth an indictment from 22 years ago. Matt Patricia was 21 years old. Um, you know, my thoughts on this – I. It's really hard to have a strong opinion on this. I, you know, I just, 
like I know it sounds a little bit like a cop out, but the bottom line is is that when you're going to slap somebody with that, that's a scarlet letter. And for better or worse, there are a lot of people that are going to look at the headline and aren't going to look deep into it and are probably just going to say to themselves, well, this probably happened and think of Matt Patricia in this light from now on. And that's not fair. That's a very serious thing to slap on somebody. So if he didn't do it, then this is awful that this is happening. His family has to deal with it. If he's innocent, his his wife, his kids have to deal with this. His parents have to deal with it. Like it's just it's a horrible thing to slap somebody with if there's not, if there truly is nothing here. If there is something here and something did happen, then obviously I think we all would be for reopening the case and making him pay a price for it. And so that's to me why there's it's hard to have a strong opinion on this. I mean, I look at it and like I look at the Detroit news story and they had the indictment, which is definitely something and definitely, you know, worth looking into and definitely like the, the, the jumping off point for a story. My bigger question is, you know, they kept turning over rocks and they kept getting nothing. And then a couple of days after, now all of a sudden, okay, well, there's medical evidence. Well, you know, why didn't you wait a little longer? It just felt like there was a little bit of a rush to get the story out there when I think the result when the story ran was we have the indictment, but we turned over all of these rocks and there was nothing there yet. It's a it's a high stakes game. So again, tough to have an opinion on that. I felt like it was a little it's just like the the story was not quite there yet when it came out. Um you know, obviously, p- different people have different opinions on that, but we saw some of the stuff that came out over the weekend, too, that I think should have been in the initial story. Uh, okay, number five, last one before we get to all of your questions up there on Periscope. Uh, okay, so I want to mention, obviously, that we're past the rookie mini camps now. So all 32 teams have had rookie mini camps. Not all of them got out on the field. For a lot of them, this was a teaching camp, but uh, the big story every year with the rookie camps, right? The big story every single year with these rookie camps is. How do the young quarterbacks look? Where are you at with the young quarterbacks? And so uh, I think we'll, what I wanted to do was look at the five of these guys, and I'm going to explain to you how you can figure out how to win your prop bets, okay, because sports gambling is a big thing today. So here's how you can win your prop bets, okay? Okay, so the the, 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 num- the numbers out there, and I believe these are from Bovada. Um, yeah, they're from Bovada. The over-under is a number of starts for each of the rookies. Josh Allen with Buffalo, 10-5. Uh, Baker Mayfield with Cleveland, 9-5. Josh Rosen with Arizona, 8-5. Sam Darnold with the Jets, 5-5. Five, five. And Lamar Jackson with the Ravens, 0.5. And so Lamar Jackson will probably be the safest bet. Joe Flacco gets hurt. He's in there. Joe Flacco uh, doesn't look great. He's in there. Joe Flacco, the, the, the Ravens don't play well. The Ravens are, are, are out of the playoff race. He probably gets in there. But here's what you want to look at when, you wanna, when, 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 you're, when you're looking about, is my rookie quarterback going to start? Okay. I'm going to give you guys two things, then we're going to jump onto your questions. So hang on, hang tight. We'll get to your questions there in a second, okay? Rookie quarterbacks. Again, five teams have rookie quarterbacks. Five teams have first-round quarterbacks. Browns, Bills, Ravens, Jets, and Cardinals. Okay. Let's go to the last 10 draft classes, okay? All the first-round quarterbacks in the last 10 10 draft classes, okay? Only two have really been redshirted. Now, everybody talks this time of year, well, you know, the, 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 this guy's going to get redshirted. That guy's going to redshirt. And it all sounds great, right? And we're talking about upwards of 30 quarterbacks in that 10-year period. Two were redshirted. Jake Locker with the Titans Pat in 2011. Pat Mahomes with the Chiefs in 2017. What do those two teams have in common? They both had winning records. The Titans finished 9-7. and seven. The Chiefs finished 11-5. and five. Both were in the playoff race all year long. And that's why the Titans weren't going to move away from Matt Hasselbeck and why the Chiefs weren't going to move away from Alex Smith. And so the number one thing, if you if you want to look at where your quarterback's going to start, if he doesn't win, the, and I think a couple of these guys will win in week one, the number one thing that you want to look at here, okay, the number one thing is, is my team in contention? If your team is, falls out of contention, then the number, the, 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 the percentage chance that he's going to get into a game is going to explode. Okay. Second fact that I'm going to give you guys, only three teams, only three times in the last 10 years has a team made the playoffs and picked a quarterback the year after, okay? Only three times has a playoff team picked a quarterback in the first round the year after. And that's like how many quarterbacks have gone in the last 10 years. I don't have the exact figure here, but it's close. It's like 30, right? The only three teams that have done it have all done it in the last two years. 
okay? It, it was Paxton Lynch two years ago, and then last year it was Pat Mahomes with the Chiefs and Deshaun Watson with the Texans, okay? The Broncos intended to sit Paxton Lynch the whole year. The Chiefs did sit Pat Mahomes the whole year. The Texans intended to sit Deshaun Watson, but they didn't have a viable answer. And so the interesting thing is that none of the five teams this year fit into that category of being a team coming off of a play. So they're not great teams right now. And if you think they're going to take that next step, the Browns with Tyrod Taylor, the Bills with A.J. McCarron, the Ravens with Joe Flacco, the Jets with Josh McCown, the Cardinals with Sam Bradford, if you think that they're going to make that next take that next step, and get to the playoffs, God bless you, then maybe the rookie won't play. But if that doesn't happen, there's a good chance we're going to see those rookies. Okay, I'm going to get to all your questions now. I see there are still 140 of you up there. So those are the five things that I wanted to hit on going into today. And Periscope, bring me some questions right now. We'll go through them. We're at 20 minutes. We'll go for about seven or eight more minutes. How about that? As long as you guys give me questions. How is Patricia different than Zeke? That's a great question and a fair question. It's fair to ask the question about how player situations are treated differently. I would tell you that the reason that the league may not launch a full-scale um, a full-scale investigation into this case versus what they did with um, you know, Zeke Elliott or Ray Rice or Greg Hardy is the precedent they set last year with Gary and Connolly. Now, Gary and Connolly, of course, was accused of something before the draft, and the league didn't like launch the same sort of investigation because Gary and Connolly wasn't in the league when it happened. That's what they said at the time, why they weren't doing a full-scale investigation. I would assume in this case that it would be similar, unless something, unless there's some sort of hard evidence that comes up, in which case I think they'll have to, and I think the standard should be higher for coaches than, the, than it is for players because these are the guys who are like setting the tone for the entire organization. Um. I don't think that there will be an investigation launched, and they have precedent to fall back on on that one. All right, more questions. Thoughts on the Patriots releasing Tony Garcia? I thought that was an interesting move based on the fact they spent a third-round pick on him. Obviously, his situation health-wise has not gotten a whole lot better. So many safeties are uh, signed already who are worse than Reed, Bacaro, Boston. Why is that? My guess is normally in these cases it's about the player's financial expectations. Um you know, it's easy for a safety who may be on the fringes of the league to take like a one year, two million dollar deal or a two year deal for four million bucks with incentives. It's easy to do that if you're a guy who's just on the fringes of the NFL. If you're somebody like Boston who had a great year last year, if you're somebody like Vaccaro, who was a former first round pick, it's a lot harder to swallow taking less. It's like with Adrian Peterson, you know, he was so used to making so much money, like the idea of going in, going somewhere in the league minimum, it's a tough Tough, tough idea to get your head around. Who do you think? What do you think the is a realistic stat line for Sony Michelle? E O Y. I don't know what E O Y means. I would say let's give Sony Michelle 600 yards rushing and 45 catches. Thoughts on the AFC South projected winner? It's funny the AFC South for the longest time was such a bad division, maybe the best division in football. Now I'm going to give you the Jags coming back. The Titans or are going to make some noise. And, you know, I, I look at the Colts, and there's a lot of good pieces there. I don't think they're, they, they, they've got a ways to go as far as rounding out the roster. But you look at it now, Quentin Nelson, Malik Hooker, Quincy Wilson, there are some good young players in that roster, and I think they're going to get better uh, this year. Why is live betting props different from regular games for the NFL? Because the NFL can control – the 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 in-game prop betting a little bit more people are conditioned to go to certain places for um, people are conditioned to go to certain places for betting on spreads for betting against odds and they're not going to make odds on those sorts of things um, Texans offensive line improved I believe so it can't be much worse than it was at the beginning of last year um, losing Dwayne Brown's obviously a blow and not getting Nate Solder was a blow for them. It's going to be about a lot of their young talent, like Martin, getting better on the fly. Let's do five more questions. Rank these quarterbacks fantasy-wise. Brady, Jimmy G, Watson. I'm not great at fantasy numbers, but let's go Let's go Brady 1, Watson 2, Jimmy 3. 
Do you know if the Florida will be one of the states that gets sports betting? I don't know yet. Quarterback with better stats, Cousins or Garoppolo. Um, let's go with Cousins because of the situation around him. Um, I think it's really, really good with Diggs and Thielen and Rudolph. Gronk going to stay in New England long term. To me, the magic date, the magic number, um, May 24th, that's when he's eligible to do a deal without the team having to jump through a bunch of hoops cap-wise. Was that five questions? We'll do a couple more. Darnold's and Bates a good match? Yes, I believe so. I think – I'll just tell you this. I think Bates's guy was Josh Rosen. I think after a weekend with, Jer with, with Sam Darnold, Jeremy Bates was doing cartwheels to the Jets facility. Uh, Braxton Berrios going to make the Pats roster. I'm going to say yes. Any news on Dez? No, he's another one of these guys where I think the financial the, the financial expectation is going to need to come down a little bit. All right, I appreciate you guys coming out. Again, I want to do this as much as we possibly can. I know it's a slow time of year, but any NFL questions you've got, I think this is a great forum to answer them because I can answer them in real time. We do it a little bit more detailed on the pod on Friday morning where I actually go through questions and give you guys more detailed answers. This is a good place to get rapid fire, everything that you guys uh, want to get to and get to some of the news of the day. Will Pyle's doing a great job with this as usual, and we both want to do it more often. So, again, the more feedback I get from you guys on this, the better it is. The better we're going to be able to make it. We're going to be able to incorporate some stuff. We're going to be able to tell people, hey, this is something that really is catching on and doing well. So get me on my Twitter page with with that. Anything you guys have that you think we can do be differently, better, at Albert Breer. You can get me on my Facebook page, at Albert R. Breer. Um, get me on yeah, get me in those two places. And you can message me on Facebook, too, and then I can use those questions on our traditional podcast, too. And always, always, always remember to listen to the MMQB 10 Things podcast, the MMQB podcast with Peter King, for at least a couple more weeks. And one more time, this podcast, the MMQB podcast with Albert Breer, both the YouTube edition and the traditional edition that pops into your Apple podcasts on Friday mornings. You can get us on Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Play. One more time, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your shows. And we will see you guys on Friday morning.